Good evening everyone and welcome to the 5th New South Wales Family Daycare Association webinar in the PD in Your Pocket series. My name is Elizabeth and I'm your facilitator for this evening. Before we begin, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the country on which we meet today. I know we're on many different lands with many different traditional owners, but I'm currently presenting from the land of the Wiradjuri and Gadigal people. And I would like to acknowledge them and recognize their continuing connection to land, waters and culture. I'd like to pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. I acknowledge that Aboriginal families have cared and educated for children on this land for tens of thousands of years. Just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. I have you all on mute this evening, so you can hear me, but I can't hear you. It just gets a bit busy with background noise otherwise. So at any stage you would like to add in a comment or if you have a question, please use the chat box and I will check on this regularly. I'm now going to share the PowerPoint presentation with you. So everyone should now be able to see the presentation. So let's go through um, and remind ourselves how PD in Your Pocket works, uh, in case you've forgotten since the last session. So firstly, you would have received a resource booklet. We sent you a link to a specially prepared booklet at the beginning of the month. So you've had a couple of uh, weeks to read through this on your iPad or on your computer. If you didn't receive this, you can follow the link on your screen um, and download that booklet. If you um, are listening to it at the, as a podcast, the link is www.nswfdc.org.au forward slash PD in your pocket forward slash art. And then you are going to receive great content, which is in tonight's session. So you will either be participating in this as a live webinar, watching it as a video, or listening to it as a podcast. If you are participating in, a, um, in the live session tonight, remember that you can always go to the PD in Your Pocket page on the website and watch or listen to it later if there's anything you want to hear again. This session is short, it should go for about 45 minutes. And for those who are participating in it live, you can also, um, you will also be followed by an interview, um, which we will play. And then there'll be about a 20 minute session for questions. So please, as we go along, you're welcome to put in any questions and comments. Otherwise, we'll also have a lot of time for those at the end. After the session, you'll then receive the follow-up reading, and these have been specially chosen um, to explore more about this particular topic. You can then all have a group discussion on Facebook. So when you enrolled, we invited you to join a closed Facebook group with other educators um, and other members of the family daycare community. You can discuss this topic um, and tell them about your service and what you do. If you have any other questions at a later stage about PD in your pocket, you can also email us at info at nswfdc.org.au. So let's have a look at what we'll be covering in tonight's session. This session has been funded through the New South Wales Department of Education Sector Development Program. I'd like to start by asking who has read the booklet that we sent out? Everyone can use the chat box to put up or put up your hand function um, to let me know if you've read the booklet. Great, so it looks like a lot of people have read that, which is fantastic. And that'll give you a good start to informing you what we'll be looking at this evening. So we will be concentrating on four main topics. Firstly, why art is important in family daycare. We'll be addressing some barriers to the inclusion of visual arts, the elements of art, and then educating while doing art. So let's first explore why art is important in family daycare. So on the slide here, I have seven developmental benefits of the arts. 
you can see they impact on different areas of development, including cognitive, social and emotional. So the first one there is maths concepts. We also have decision making, so the need to make decisions and choices. Visual learning, so drawing, sculpting, threading beads. Children learn to interpret and criticise using visual information and making choices around these. Inventiveness, so it really stimulates the process and experience of thinking and making things better. It also assists children with their self-esteem. So it gives children autonomy to express themselves. I mentioned this later on, but there really is no right or wrong answer with creative art. So it's a wonderful way for children to express themselves and to get to know how they are as an individual. We also see that it, uh, it develops their motor skills. So whether it's them um, using paintbrushes, crayons, clay, lots of different mediums that uh, work on their fine motor and dexterity. It also assists with their language. So it offers an opportunity to talk about what feelings they elicit through music and art, um, provide opportunities to learn. So things like colors, shapes and actions. You'll see there's a lot of vocabulary that we look at when dealing with uh, visual art. So they're the seven main developmental benefits that we look at. When children um, do visual arts, they can also explore their experiences, express their cre creativity. They learn about color, texture and shape, which are all concepts that we'll look at in more detail. They learn about symbols, develop knowledge about their culture, enter into imaginative worlds and also explore the concept of what is beauty. Now, when it comes to visual arts, we can also tend to come across some barriers, um, not just in family daycare or across the industry, but I've got some here that are quite commonly addressed within family daycare. So let's have a look at those. So before we go through the barriers, it's important to note that not everyone does have barriers. Um, the above picture taken is by Dr. Red Ruby Scarlett's book, Becoming with Art. Um, and it's by a family daycare educator who's also an artist. Her name is Heidi Upwin, and she created this artwork with the children she cares for. So we know that many family daycare educators create beautiful art with their children on a daily basis. Some of you will spend more time creating art than doing anything else. If it's something that you personally enjoy um, or that you feel is a strength, it may be something that you do very frequently, but it really depends how you as an educator embrace the visual arts. For some, art is only a small part of the work you do with children. So after tonight, we hope to find some ways of developing your understanding of visual arts and ensuring that you can implement that with your children. So one of the first barriers we look at is um, that some of us are just not naturally born artists. Um, we may have had some negative experiences of learning how to do art when we were young children. And we learn that art is not something that we're good at. Um, and so we tend to avoid it maybe if it's not something we particularly enjoy. Some of us have never learnt the skills needed to teach children art, or maybe it was just not covered in our training. <clears throat> so like any other area of development, it's really important that we're able to scaffold and mentor children's learning in the art. We may have art material available for children, but that's as far as it goes. We can't demonstrate art techniques to children because we don't know them ourselves. So it can happen, but it's important that we invest some time in looking at what our role as the educator is and what we can do to support the children in our care. Another common barrier that we look at is cost. Um, so, it is known that it can be a costly thing to implement the arts in care. Um, replacing consumable arts and craft materials may be one of the biggest costs in family daycare. 
And art materials can be really expensive, like a beautiful set that you see here from Germany. This can be upwards of thousands of dollars. Um, and then it can be also really disheartening when children waste materials or they can forget to put lids on or wash brushes um, or they overfill things like paints and glue. So it, it can be disheartening, um, but we need to remind ourselves as family daycare educators that we can always find affordable options and also really sustainable options. So looking at what's available in our homes, um, and what's available in our local community, in our environment. It doesn't need to be a costly exercise. We can easily find things around us, whether it be in your garden or your recycling bin, um, and really finding materials for children to work with. Now, another big barrier I'm sure we're all aware of is mess. Um, there's no doubt that art can be one of the messier things that we do in family daycare. Not only does it make our home messy, but the children can get very messy. And after some art sessions, we end up needing to wash the children and the house and their clothes and everything else that they've been around. So it can be hard to put your hands up for that extra work. But despite these barriers, we need to engage in art in family daycare. There are always ways around these barriers and there's some really clever ideas. You know, you can use drop mats, um, you can designate a particular area of the home or even take it outdoors so that you can then just hose down surfaces or find ways to make things easier for yourself. And it really is worth dedicating the extra cost and the extra time required to provide these experiences. The children will love it. It will have great outcomes and it's very important to many areas of their development. You can also think about doing some professional development for educators around how you can improve your skills in implementing these activities. So the next thing I want to look at this evening is the elements of art. So the elements of art are the building blocks used by artists to create a work of art. We're going to go through each one of these um, one at a time because it's important that you have the knowledge to impart to the children. Of course, for some of you, this knowledge is very much something you already have. Hopefully listening to it again will reinforce that for you. Now, the first element we look at is lines. So it seems like so, something so simple, um, but there's a bit more to it. So lines, um, they're any marking with greater length and width. Lines can be horizontal, they can be vertical, diagonal, straight, curved, thick or thin. So take a look around you and you'll find examples of lines everywhere. It seems impossible to imagine art without using lines in some form. And they're usually the first thing we see children start to do is lines. So um, first come lines and then we start seeing them um, do circles usually as a simple shape. And then they go on to do more complex shapes, which they then start to name and they become objects. Um, so to put simply, a line is an identifiable path created by a point moving in space. However, when it comes to using design elements of uh, lines, there is nearly endless potential. They often lead a viewer's eye around composition and communicate messages through the distinct qualities. Lines can vary in width, length and direction. And when used uh, strategically, these variations can elicit certain psychological responses for a viewer. For example, a curvy line has the ability to suggest comfort and ease, while a jagged line, like the second one on the slide there, can evoke anxiety and commotion. So you can see how the visual arts can actually relate to emotional um, development of a child. The next thing that we consider <clears throat> is shapes. So shapes um, are where lines become closed. Shapes can be geometric like squares and circles or organic like free form uh, natural shapes. Shapes are flat and can express length or width. 
but they have no depth yet. Shapes are with lines all around us. From a young age, you learn that a pizza may resemble a triangle and a circle may resemble a plate of biscuits. Um, so you can see strategically how they might provide messages to the audience. So a child might see a simple triangle, but then using their imagination, they may point out, oh, a piece of pizza. So this is how they begin to develop those skills of connecting shapes to objects. In art, lines and shapes almost always go together and they have a lot of the same qualities. Shapes play an important role in the creation of art. Different characteristics of shapes evoke different moods and meanings. They are also an important element of design in space since they create movement within a piece um, and lead the eye from one design element to the next. Shapes are typically two dimensional, meaning they only have length and width. However, not all shapes will be classified as the same type. You're able to classify uh, negative um, you're able to classify shapes either as geometric or organic and intention of the artist, each shape will uniquely take on the characteristics of the different classifications. And that's what we see later on. So the next um, development on from shapes is forms. So forms are more three dimensional um, and they express length, width and then the depth as well. So this includes things like balls, cylinders, boxes, and pyramids. So you can see how we're getting more complex as we go along. A form is an artist's way of using elements of art, principles of design and media. Forms are an element of art in three-dimensional and, and enclosed spaces. So like a shape, a form has length and width, but, but also depth. And forms are also either geometric or free form. The next thing we look at is colour, which we all know is something that's very popular with the zero to five age group. <clears throat> and I'm sure you've been asking all the time, what is your favourite colour? Even though you're not aware of it, colour has the ability to have tremendous effects on our emotion, our mood and even appetite. So artists have an understanding of colour psychology and deliberately use colour to influence the habits of consumers. So you might find in a, in a painting experience, if you put out a tray of paint options with very um, calm pastel colors or maybe lots of different shades of blue, you might elicit different emotions in the children as opposed to if you put out some really bright, stark um, primary colors or you know some oranges and reds and yellows that are really bright so or fluorescent colors, you might get different um, outcomes from the children. So what your eyes see as colour is really just perception. For instance, if you look up at the sky and you see the colour blue, what's really going on is the data that's being sent from our eyes to our brain in the form of wavelengths. And these wavelengths tell us that the colour of the sky is blue. So colours have three main characteristics. They have a hue, um, they have value, and they have intensity. So intensity is a spectrum of bright and dark. Value is the spectrum of, um, is also a value of light and dark. And our hues are things like blue, red, and green. And they all contribute to what color communicates and how it's used. So artists vary um, the value intensity of color and create contrast with composition. You may be familiar with something uh, like a color wheel. And that's used to classify colors into three categories. So we've got our primary colors, <clears throat> we've got our secondary colors, and we've got our tertiary colors. So by drawing a line through the middle of the color wheel, you're able to uh, separate the warm um, colors and the cool colors. So white is pure light and black is the absence of light. 
primary colors are only true colors and all other colors are then those primary colors mixed into each other. So really, if you can buy your primary colored paints, which a lot of us do, you can then make lots of different other paint um, colors. And then if you get white paint, you can then make different shades. So light and dark, greens, blues, whatever it is. When, com uh, when complementary colors are mixed together, they then neutralize to make a brown. So I'm sure we've all experienced when we put out lots of beautiful colors, uh, but after 45 minutes of vigorous painting and, um, and mixing all together, we come out with a simple brown painting. Um, so that's really all those paints and colors just neutralizing each other. Um, Great, and then the next thing that we look at is texture. So texture is the surface quality that can be seen and felt. So textures can be rough or smooth or soft or hard. Textures do not always feel the way they look. For example, a drawing of a porcupine may look prickly, but if you were to touch the drawing, the paper is still smooth. So the point there is that we can actually um, portray and develop texture um, through the image without actually creating it in reality. Texture in art appeals to our sense of touch, which can evoke feelings of nostalgia, delight and discomfort. While you can't actually feel a two-dimensional design, artists use texture to give the um, viewer a visual perception of what that experience would be like. So this is something you might want to experience with the children in your care. Texture is everywhere and there's endless ways to describe it. So you'll see lots of vocabulary coming through um, with the children. You know, they might use words like rough or smooth or fuzzy. Um, and this is a great way to encourage that. And also with visual arts, if you're doing an activity like collaging and you're using um, materials beyond paint, um, that's when you can really get into texture. Um, but even just with the simple crayon, you know, depending how thickly it's applied to the paper, you can start getting raised areas and bumpy areas. So there's lots of things that we can do exploring with texture. <clears throat> We then need to look at the concept of size. So when we look at size, it's commonly associated with scale. And it's an important tool for artists to emphasize um, an interest in their own design. So think about a piece of art and wouldn't it be boring if every shape and object in the composition was the same size? So size, which is commonly uh, associated with scale, is an important tool for artists to emphasize the interests of their design. The psychology behind size is also an important aspect of the element of design. So when an object is larger or more grand in comparison to objects, the more power and weight that it carries. Like many other elements of art, sizing is essential to communicate a message or a story. And while in some areas size can create great contrast and interest, it's also there to help better express ideas. So you can see that even from a young age, some children um, have a really good concept of size. When they're drawing a picture of their family, they might put mummy and daddy or um, grandparents or their carers as quite um, tall compared to the children in the family. Um, but then you'll see in really young children, there really isn't that um, understanding yet. You know, they'll draw stick figures with huge hands um, that are twice as big as their head because that concept isn't there yet or they don't have the ability to draw things in the right scale. So it's a really nice thing to document as children develop their skills in drawing, um, how they're able to control that, that concept of size. And the last one that we want to look at is space. So space is the area between and around objects. And in art, space, offers, uh, space refers to how a piece of artwork is organized, the area above, below, and within components of a piece. 
The relationship between these areas, so the foreground, the background and the middle ground, it's strategically used by artists to give a, the illusion of depth to a flat surface. Just as with shape, space can be positive or negative, and the relationship between the two is important for artists to successfully communicate meaning within their composition. Positive space can be described as a subject, while negative space is the area around and within it. So once you have too much of either positive or negative space, it can throw off the balance and rhythm of a piece of art. The contrast between positive and negative space will create balance. So that's it now for all the elements of art that we've explored. We've looked at quite a few there. When you get your further readings for this topic, you have listed, um, you have a list of video series that goes through these elements, um, especially for children. So if you want to look at them beforehand, you can look at Paint It Kids. Um, and have a look at these uh, videos that will go through all these elements and apply them really well to how they're used with children. So the next thing we want to look at is educating while doing art. So although art is clearly educative in itself and learning about art is educative, what else do educators um, incorporate so children learn even more while doing art? Now we've already touched on some things that children learn and develop, but let's have a look at some other things as well. So the first one is language. Um, and I have spoken a little about this so far. So art gives children a whole new language to learn. Names of colors, types of tools, things like shapes and lines. They invite children to talk about their art with words or stories in order to promote language development. So once that painting is completed, it doesn't mean the, le the learning needs to stop. You can then ask the children to tell a story about their painting or the tools that they use to do it. There's so much you can expand on the actual artwork. Um, and also it's a good idea to talk to the children while they're doing the art so that it's fresh in their mind and they can directly late, relate what they're saying to what they're doing. Give them the names of the techniques that they use. So introduce new vocabulary to them. Say words such as strokes and clay and mold, um, all those words that they might not be familiar with, but they could become common practice while doing their art. By inviting children to title their artwork, you also invite them to use art as a language. So make sure you always ask the child to give their work a name or to at least say what it is that they've done. Something else that we look at is skill acquisition. So introducing new art materials um, like painting with feathers invites children to build strong sense of success and mastery like they've learned a new skill. So not always just with the same paintbrushes, use a whole array of materials and they're actually developing new skills. We can also relate the visual arts to STEM, um, which is becoming more and more popular in services. So use art materials to observe, predict, experiment and problem solve. Open-ended art activities in which children have to make choices as to how to create a sculpture or picture helps foster de the development of these scientific thinking skills. So they're becoming very independent and they're um, problem solving as they go. We spoke about fine motor skills, so encourage children to use their hands and manipulate material, whether it be clay or finger painting or drawing. This helps build their fine motor skills, the same skills that children need to learn how to write letters and words. And then we look at emotional growth. So ask children to express their feelings using colour, texture and structure. Children often use colours in their drawings and paintings to express a mood and the textures of clay provide perfect places to work out frustration. So if you've got a child that's feeling a bit frustrated, um, you know, giving them some clay can be a really great outlet for that emotion. 
And going back to colour too, you know, a child might not know how to um, paint a banana in terms of perfect shape or size, but simply by selecting the colour yellow, in their mind, they're relating that to that object. So that's their way of expressing their creativity. Okay, so that's our presentation side of things. Um, we now have a video, it goes for approximately 30 minutes and it's an interview with Dr. Red Ruby Scarlett. And I just wanna say how lucky we are having access to so many people through this program that have doctorates in their topics we are interviewing them about. Dr. Scarlett is passionate about art in early education, and she's being interviewed by education and care sector journalist, Lisa Bryant. So this video is on the PD in Your Pocket webpage if you wish to view it later. So I'm going to play that for you now. And then after the video, we're going to have um, some time for questions. So if you'd like to send these through as the video is playing, that's no problem. Otherwise we can have a chat after. I'm today to be joined by Dr. Red Ruby Scarlett. Dr. Scarlett has been working as an educator in the early uh, education care sector for quite a few years. I won't say how many in case that gives away your age. <laughs> um, uh, but she also, she has a, a heap of qualifications, including a PhD, obviously, that's why she's doctor. And she's also written a wonderful book called Becoming with Art in Early Childhood, which will be on everyone's reading list. So welcome to PD in a Pocket. Thank you, Lisa. I'm, I'm really, really excited to be part of this beautiful conversation. So look, what, what I, you know, I suppose I, I'd like to ask you first off is why should we be doing art with children, and, you know, visual art with children in family daycare? I think, um, first of all, I just want to say something about the experience of family daycare that's unique to other parts of the profession, particularly around what kind of visual arts you can do because your home time is a little bit more elastic. You've got a smaller group of children. Those are the, the things that are actually um, great conditional or environmental things for really beautiful visual arts to happen. So generally speaking though, visual arts and children are almost like if we're talking about visual arts, uh, talking about children and food. Children need food to grow. They need food to be nourished. They need food to live um, and visual arts really is I guess the vehicle towards all of the ways in which they'll be able to participate not just in educational experiences but in life experience because visual arts is the relationship between how you feel what you think and how you express that or learn to express that through color or line or a particular medium like paint or drawing or something like that. Okay, so what do you, sometimes, like, we know some of the reasons why some family daycare educators are reluctant to engage in, I suppose, experimental, experimental is the wrong word, to engage intensely in art with children. Like, most family daycare educators will have an art table where children will be able to do things, but they don't extend it much more than that. Do you have any ideas of why some educators are reluctant to um, explore heavily with art? There's, there's probably three things. The first thing is, I think the outside pressures of what non-early childhood people think is good art or the right kind of art to do for children. So we, we end up with a lot of paper plate stuff or stencils or things like that because there's a, a societal understanding that if they do that, that that's a great learning experience. I think the second thing is that in the Cert 3 um, and some people have done diplomas, the focus on arts is like a teeny tiny touch. I don't think that we prepare people well in pre-service situations to A, give people skills and to B, give people confidence to try different things. 
And the third thing is, I know, you know, I've done lots and lots of art workshops over the years, and the most common um, response that people have when I ask them about why they why they struggle with doing visual arts is that they're scared or they've had a bad experience themselves in their childhood or in their educational experience. So that idea of confidence is, well, I'm not an artist, therefore I can't do art. And I guess the message I've been trying to get across through the book Becoming With Art and also the series that I have that's called Art for Educators is that we can learn how to do things. You don't have to be an artist to be able to provide really beautiful um, art, arts experiences for children where they can succeed and then you realise, hey, I'm actually quite good at this because I just put these things out, I learnt a little bit about how to use them and then I was able to create this wonderful ongoing learn experience for children. I think that thing that you said um, about as adults we may have had something terrible happen to us as children in art that convinced us that we're not artists is one of the reasons why we have to do it so well with this generation of children. So you don't get a bunch of adults, you know, children growing up to be adults who also believe that they can't create art. Yeah, we don't want to keep that cycle going. Mm. So can you explain, um, you know, what you would see as a kind of a great engagement with art, a great way to do art with children and perhaps a less good way to do art with children? So I'll give you a couple of examples, like really practical examples. I think that the stereo, first thing is to bust the stereotype. So it's great to have things on a table for children to do. It's great to have like an easel set up and painting or drawing all those things there. But I think the, the most successful ways in which I've seen people, particularly in family daycare, do arts practice well is by thinking more broadly across the environment. So for example, we talk a lot about loose parts, right? Loose parts is a, a great theory. There's lots of value to it, but it's the way you present things. So if you have a series of matchy matchy container things and you have them all sorted into their colors and you do the research at yourself and with children to say which order should these colors go in for us to understand a rainbow, for example, and you lay, you present those things out. That's a process where children are involved in setting up an arts experience. Educators are learning with children to do that. It's all recycled, so it's completely inexpensive. And the visual of that looks extraordinary. I'll send you some photographs to share with people. And then what you have is an opportunity for children to just play with those things and arrange them through colour, through size, through shape, through length, you know, all of those different elements that we already are familiar with, we're confident with that bit. But sometimes I think it's just getting the idea for setting things up that then enable creativity. And the other part that goes with that is people go, but that's so simple. That's where you get the best results with art stuff. When you've got more and more and more, it's, it's an overwhelm. Like imagine if you walked into a studio, there's pencils here, there's paints there, there's all kinds of drawing implements you've never even heard of over there, that would be overwhelm. But if you've got one thing laid out really, really carefully and really beautifully, and you've been involved in that process of laying it out, then the arts experiences are far more meaningful and they become richer because they're really firing up children's imagination. So if you think about drawing, we talk about drawing as if we're going to use a, a pencil or a texture or a crayon of some sort. When you have these beautiful recycled, little recycled materials laid out, obviously you check the safety and size and all of those kinds of things, um, but you are actually drawing by pattern making or you are drawing by creating shapes and images and lines out of those very materials. The other great part is you can photograph them, children can photograph them, very practical, very easy, and then you can sort them back so that they're there to be used again for another time. And so I think visual arts kind of get separated out into, oh, that must be a fine motor experience because you're drawing with things rather than this is a visual art experience because you're playing with colour and you're creating shapes and you're, you might be telling a story about it. And all of that is exactly what visual arts are there to represent. They're there for us to express our thoughts, our feelings, our imagination, 
and you know working things out in our minds and that's how we express them on paper that's what children do okay and on the other side of that you know a bad experience or one that sorry bad is the wrong word one that is less yeah. meaningful one, one the, yeah i guess what i think i talk about the struggle so when, what's the struggle with us providing arts experiences and then what's the struggle for children when they're trying to do them and they it doesn't work out or it becomes a big mess or so it's kind of like the setting up part creates the struggle because the educators really wanting to do a good job but struggling to do that in turn the children then struggle so it kind of becomes a bit of a flop and you know essentially in early childhood everything we do we want people to feel really good about themselves so being able to approach a situation that is a struggle um, in a different way then enables children to experience it in a different way so sometimes it can be and there was a, a research paper somebody did about this that talked about sometimes we create all environments but particularly arts environments like a supermarket so there'll be the brushes here then there'll be paints there then there'll be crayons here there'll be pencils here and there's so much there that then it just becomes a great big mess and what often happens after that is people give up and say, oh, well, the children don't respect the space. Um, but I think the thinking beforehand will actually stop that struggle in its tracks. And the thinking beforehand, which is your planning and your planning cycle, is how do I use, how do I create something small and achievable? So as an educator, I'm going to select some things that I know are going to work really well to help children express themselves. So you might say, I'm just going to have um, lead pencils out and I'm going to have white paper today but I'm going to have the really soft pencils because I know that children really love that experience when a pencil feels creamy and they you know they go over it and over it and over it on the paper so there's this wonderful kind of um, sensory experience if you like by putting out just those pencils then that might go on for a little while and you observe what children do the next thing you that you might then introduce colour and so you may even go, right, here's a, here's a whole set of pencils, go crazy. Or you might say, let's start with warm colours. We know that there's warm colours and cool colours. That's a really easy thing to learn about. Google warm colours and let's put out warm colours and see what comes from that. Or let's Google cool colours, which can all be done with children, and let's explore cool colours. And, and then do our drawings look different when we use cool colours? Do we feel different when we use cool colours? Um, you know, for very young children, I know people are always saying, how do you do this with infants? It's interesting to watch what they go for. Do they go for the warm colours and use them? Do they go for the cool colours and use them? So just by bringing everything down to something small and achievable that everybody understands, educators and children, you then have this great opportunity for success in um, providing those arts experiences. And then it takes away that struggle that then says, oh, it's a mess and it's too much and you know, I don't know how to do this and blah, 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 blah. So I think it really is about slowing things down and choosing one, we call them elements of design. So colour is one, line is another one, texture is another one, direction is another one. So you can kind of, shape is another one. Um, you can kind of go through and choose those things and think I'm going to create some experiences around that. The comforting part about working with the elements of design in visual arts is because of the language, you realise, well, actually, that's maths as well. There's science in that as well. There's language and literacy in that as well. So art really encapsulates all of the things that you know that children need to learn, which is quite reassuring, quite exciting, I think. So, um, yeah, so I guess thinking about it like that, slowing it down and making some really deliberate decisions with small achievable things. I think, I really do believe there's quite a lot of pressure on educators to have 50,000 things and it, if it doesn't look like a busy environment, then we mustn't be doing our job properly. And, and that's a real struggle for lots of people. And I know that people feel that pressure. I feel that pressure and I've got 35 years experience, you know, that I've got to go, hang on a minute, I know better learning is going to come out when I've got something that's really well thought out and it's easy and small and achievable. So for all of those things I've just said, you don't need to be an artist to be able to achieve them. And they look pretty in photos. <laughs> do, um, we, do we need to teach children how to be artists? 
do we need do we need to teach children arts practice yes do we need to teach children to be artists my belief is and you can call me one-eyed I think every human is a walking piece of artwork but do we need to teach them arts practices and skills absolutely now once again I know that there's a philosophical tension there because the minute we say we want to teach children something we think that it's sitting down and listening and you know quite didactic and direct it's not there's lots of ways that you can teach children arts practices or skills again in that with that thinking in mind that I'm going to make this small and achievable and I'm going to see what happens when I teach children those skills one example um, when I was doing my PhD at Tillman Park, beautiful Pani Otter, who is the baby whisperer, we, we were looking at the types of art practice that the young, very young children got. And it was big paintbrushes, blob, blob, blob. It was sticking things to paper plates. And, you know, it was a bit of fun, but they lasted two seconds. There was no long-term engagement. And so I said to Pani Otter, can we try something a little bit different? It might seem a bit wacky but can we try something different? And I said, when I look at infants, if like birth to twos, let's say, what are they expert on? They are expert on tiny, because they're the tiniest humans on the planet. They've got the teensy weensiest little fingers. They will find no, that- No, some babies have got quite chubby fingers. <laughs> they do, but they're small. <laughs> they're, but they, they will find that piece of glitter on the ground. So they have this kind of incredible capacity to have this connection with little, with tiny. So I said to her, development will tell us that we've got to give them fat things to hold. But what if we noticed that, what if we tried to do tiny with them? So we gave them teeny tiny little crayons about that big and we gave them teeny tiny paper about that big. And it was really interesting to see the control that they had because of obviously their fine motor skills have got a long way to develop, but the control that even very young bubbers who weren't walking there in high chairs had in that experience because they are so used to being small and focused. Then what we did was we tested our theory. We gave them A3 paper and bigger crayons. And of course they went like that and it was over in two seconds. Then we gave them the small paper again and there was this engagement. And eventually, because we gave them similar experiences, not the same, but similar experiences all the time, those very, very young children were sitting there for periods of up to an hour sometimes because some of them would cover the whole page. Some of them would do lots of drawings one after the other on the teeny tiny paper. And we learned about this expertise. Well, we, you know, that was our claim that when we gave them big, it was like this and over in two seconds. When we gave them little, it drew them into their own expertise. And so I love that story because it felt like we were doing, you know, taking a bit of a risk. Um, but what we got out of it was not just beautiful. Like the, you can imagine little tiny lines and how squiggly they would have been gorgeous. So not only did we get beautiful art, but we learned so much about the children and we learned so much about ourselves and what gets in the way of doing beautiful art, particularly with young children like that. So I think that's, so you, that kind yeah. of story is really inspiring because I'm sure a lot of educators listening to us tonight or, you know, um, watching this video will go, wow, yeah, yeah I want to try that with my children. Can you give me yeah. a to, to um, you know, instances of things that you think have worked really well with the children you've been working with? Yeah, sure. So, um, and I'm happy to give you, give you a few other prompts if you think people will find those things helpful. Because the good thing is, when you say use little paper and use little pieces of crayons, tiny pencils, um, it's not like you're giving a standard thing. So anybody can provide that to children, but you'll get different results. Um, I want to talk a little bit, before I give you two more examples, I, wanted, I just want to talk a little bit about the teaching. So, we will, um, you know, when children are sometimes just picking up the crayons or the pencils, practicing that. And so showing children, oh, I'm going to pick it up like this. Now I'm going to pick it up with all my fingers. Now I'm going to pick it up and put it between these two fingers. So you're kind of giving them ideas about how they might 
build a relationship with those arts materials. And by doing it together as a little playful moment, that's how the teaching happens. It doesn't happen as in here, sit here and put your pencil up and put your paper on the table. So that's one thing. The other thing is that when we're, like if I'm introducing watercolours to children, and I have done this with very young children, right, first to five, but always, always do the work with the infants as well, is that I might, I never draw for children. I never give them outlines. I never give them those kinds of things. But I will go, when I use a watercolour pencil, Sometimes I do a line, sometimes I'll do a little wiggle on the page, I'll do it softly, and this time I'm going to press hard because it looks different, and then I'm going to get the watercolour brush and go, and I can make this one lighter here by just putting a little bit of water there, or I can make this one a nice creamy spot because I've got quite a lot of pencil there, and when I swish it around, it's going to make a lovely blob. And so then they see, they get the technique of how to use the watercolour pencil that has two parts to it. But it's also then valuing that it doesn't have to draw a person. They don't have to draw a, a cat or, a, I mean, everybody should draw cats, what am I saying? Um, <laughs> they don't have to draw a thing. It's the experience of learning the skill of using the arts materials. And, and what naturally happens for children is that they then go, it will remind them of something, oh, that looks like my my auntie's swimming pool. And then suddenly a swimming pool story will come from it. So it does this beautiful thing of conjuring up um, imagination by learning the skill of how to use that. And look, you know, obviously I think Google and YouTube are such wonderful resources for 10 minute, five minute videos, how to use watercolor pencils. Um, you can always ask me. There's, you know, any of those things, there are always um, easy ways to find those things out. And, it's watching that stuff with children too. You know, it's fun to watch well, how, how are we going to use this together? So not being under pressure that you've got to make all these decisions without involving children. So the other thing that I just wanted to say about um, great experiences is um, I think the beauty of family daycare, as I said, is you've got a small number of children. The older children will teach the younger children. So just by being together, you get this wonderful experience because children will have some knowledge of colour, line, shape, all those elements of design. And they'll bring that into the conversation, which is the beautiful language piece that's going on. So the success is that when you, you know, people might say, oh, that's only for the older children. Because you're in this ideal context, you can teach something to the older children and the younger children are automatically going to want to be part of that because it's a, a clear, beautiful space. There's one thing going on your relationship is driving the engagement with that material and then you get these beautiful outcomes. And in your head you go, it doesn't have to be a thing, they don't have to draw a something or other, knowing that they eventually will. Um, all you have to do is get surrender to that encounter, be in that moment with those children, pass on that skill or learn the skill together and then you get this wonderful instant success. So the third thing I'm going to tell you is um, a fun way to start drawing seems to be the most familiar with people. It also seems to be the one that people have the most blah about because, you know, I can't draw. But there are three Sorry, types of... Can I just stop you there? Why, why the inverted commas? Like some of us can't draw. Oh, look, the phrase that comes to mind is pants on fire. I think that what it, it depends what you think drawing is. So we think drawing is being able to create a Leonardo da Vinci. And whilst his sketches are lovely, if you think about Indigenous artists, it's a completely different use of the elements of design in terms of how people are represented or what a portrait looks like. So I think the stereotype about um, what drawing is get, makes us feel like we can or can't draw. Because the minute you put a mark on paper, that's a drawing. Whoa, okay, mind blown, but <laughs> keep going. <laughs> You're a drawer, Lisa Bryant, I know it. <laughs> <laughs> well, it is, and it's then to value that because then you'll go, oh, well, if I put another line here, it turns into something else. If I add something else, it's something else. Drawing isn't about making a picture. It's about a expressing a feeling and it's about having a relationship with the material and the moment to produce something. So three ways, to, three fun ways to think about drawing is, and you know, just put out soft lead pencils 
and just some A4 paper, really simple to start with. Um, they're drawing by observation. So you'll, you'll get my, I'll get my glasses, maybe not glasses, I'll get a cup and I'll, I'll draw, I'll say to the children, do you reckon you could draw that by looking at it? This is looking and drawing, looking and drawing. So that's again, teaching another skill, looking and drawing, looking and drawing, which they're kind of doing anyway. If they draw a picture of their house, they've looked at their house, they've drawn their house. Um, but you can give them interesting things to look at, look and draw, look and draw. The second thing is that you then draw by memory. What did you do at the weekend? We went to the park with our dog and we da 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 da. Now, you might not draw the scene of the park. You might draw the dog, or the child might draw the dog or the dog's foot or the dog's ear or a, a bone or whatever, you know, goes with that moment. But that still counts as a drawing by memory. And then the last one is drawing by imagination, which we see children do a little bit more when they're kind of older because they start drawing and then it'll turn into something. The other part is that then, um, you know, that they'll be into a TV show or they'll have seen a movie or um, grandma's read them a storybook that they love that's got all these wonderful enchanting um, fantasy themes in it. And so then that will start to influence their drawings. So thinking about that, what it also gives you is something to do. It gives you a framework for analysis. Is this drawing by observation? What skills are involved? We know that developmental stuff. Is this drawing by memory? Is a child telling me something about where they've been or who they're connected with or where they live or something that they love? And then drawing by imagination, um, I can see that this child's got a wild imagination or I can see that there's a lot of input from TV there or I can see that they go for lots of walks in the bush or so, um, you know, and then fairies make it into the bush or whatever it is that conjures up their imagination. So that's the beauty of really slowing things down, making them small and achievable and giving yourself permission to go, that might take me a few goes, but I can definitely learn how to do it. Okay, that kind of inspires me to go out and do it straight away. One final question, right? Presume I'm an educator that has lead pencils, textures, some paper and a set of cheap paints on my, you know, for my children to play with. And you've inspired me to maybe explore something a bit more. What are the essential art materials that every family daycare educator's home should have? There's two parts to that. One is the good old fashioned, what was the box they had on play school, the useful box? A useful box of recycled clean, obviously, recycled materials is essential because it then enables you to do, you can draw with fabric, you can draw with string, you can draw with bottle tops, you can draw with those collected items. So that's one piece, but I would have them all, of course, beautifully organised. The second piece is having some lovely soft lead pencils and they're not too expensive. Like it, I think there's a stereotype that really good art stuff is super expensive. I mean, there is some super expensive stuff, but buy relatively good quality and teach the skill and it will last forever. And the way that I explain that is you can buy textures, a lid gets lost, they get wrecked, you buy the $2 shop ones, they're more likely to get wrecked because they don't do the job. By the time you add up the amount of times you've bought the $2 shop textures, that will equate to five packets of really good quality textures. And you can get them in, you can get not bad ones in like Target. So I'm not talking about hundreds of dollars here. I'm just talking about, you know, a little bit higher end. Um, so I would definitely have soft lead pencils I would have some nice quality colour pencils. I would have textures I am and are with because a lot of the drawing that I do with children is with black felt tip stuff because from, a, from an educational perspective, it's like think about scientific diagrams. They're kind of pencil or ink and paper, that's it. So if we think about working things through in, in terms of drawing, just having paper, white paper and black um, art line pens gives the opportunity for children to work things through without the distraction of colour. But at the same time, or as another experience, you want colour to be available. So therefore you'll have some really nice, I don't use crayons with children. I don't, I don't really use pastels. I use um, a medium called Conte. It's a cross between a chalk and a crayon. And 
again, they're little and children know to care for them. I've had a, I've had a tin of them for, I don't know, at least five years since I've been at Clavelli and they're, you know, they're being used well, but they're, they've lasted and lasted and lasted because children um, use them really well. So I think, yeah, main things are have, have paint that's like Chrome is a really good brand. It's washes out of clothes. It's ethically made and it's not too expensive. Um, get some nice paper and pencils. Get Use recycled paper wherever you can. And you can talk to children about this one's a draft. This one's a thinking piece. Um, if we do want to make something special, we might use that paper. But when we're doing lots of drafts, when we're practicing over and over, isn't it good, you know, sustainability wise to use some recycled paper so we can get out, practice up all the things that we'd like to express and then express them on the, the good one. So I think, yeah, pencils, lead pencils for sure, some good quality um, colour pencils, paper, nice paper, cartridge paper if you want for watercolours, watercolour pencils and, um, and some nice quality paints. But remember, don't have them all out at once. Choose one thing, explore it over and over and make sure you give yourself, I'm going to do this five times before I go, oh, that hasn't worked, I'm going to give up. So the will and the commitment and the relationship are as much as what you'll get out of the medium as what the medium is. Okay. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm sure that people are inspired to get out there and get some of those things immediately and start working with us. Thank yeah, you. Beautiful. And I'm looking forward to seeing your drawing, Lisa, given that you're about to dash out and start too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. Thanks, Lisa. Welcome back, everyone. That was such a fantastic interview. I really enjoyed watching that. And I really liked um, how she was explaining the sensory joy that children get, you know, by doing something so simple as um, drawing with the soft lead pencils on the paper. And I think often as educators, I know myself, there's probably been times where I've maybe dismissed that work because it's not aesthetically pleasing or it's not really colourful. It's not something that I want to put on the wall. Um, but it was just such a nice reminder to hear her say what a wonderful sensory experience that the children were getting from doing something like that. So that was fantastic. I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it too. Um, we now have time for questions. So Quite a lot um, of you put through some great questions um, during the interview. So I'm going to start with them. <clears throat> um, the first one was, um, so an educator was saying that they find it quite hard to use different techniques when they have different age groups of children. Um, and so how can we make sure that everyone's included when we do have different age groups? So it's a fantastic question. Um, I guess it's still really important that we expose children of all ages, as long as it's safe to do so, um, to all different kinds of art mediums, so different experiences, different activities, and I guess as long as it's safe to do so, um, maybe possibly there's some artistic materials that aren't safe at really young ages, but I guess that we need to adjust our expectations. We need to understand that um, this is a, is a way of children expressing themselves creatively um, and remembering that there's no right or wrong answer. So we're not, we don't want to expect an outcome when we put out creative activities and say, okay, well, I want all my children to achieve this kind of painting or creation or drawing. We just need to give them free reign and let them go and see what happens. Um, because something else we need to remember when we look at art is that it's all about perspective as well. And I love um, displaying children's work as much as possible. And that brings me to one of the other questions is, um, what are some good tips on documenting children's visual art? So as much as possible, I always love to display children's work. It really gives them a sense of pride. Um, and it also shows what I was talking about before is that there's so much perspective when it comes to creativity. So you can put out the same object for a group of children to paint, but you're going to get lots of different results from all the different children um, because they're all perceiving that object a different way. So that's an important thing to um, 
remember when you're looking at different age groups, going back to that previous questions, is that different skills and abilities will have different outcomes when we look at creativity. So make sure that we're fair with our expectations or we don't have any expectations. We let children express themselves the way they want to with any of their art mediums. Um, just going back to documenting, it's also nice to include the original artwork whenever possible, I feel, um, and include notes on the context of how it was done. So you can include details like, was there uh, music playing? Was it a social event? Were there other children working collaboratively or working together in the same space? Or was it done independently? Was that child um, alone at the time working by themselves? You could include details like the choice of materials. Did the child have a choice or was it prescribed to them what they needed to use and what they needed to do? How much instruction was the child given? Were they inside? Were they outside? How were they feeling? I think it's really nice to include that kind of context when we're documenting children's creative work. Um, and again, always ask the children about their own work, ask them what it's called, or what it's about, give it a name, talk me through it. And you can do this before the, before the art's done or during the process. It's always important to ask the child their perspective and what they think that um, their artwork is reflecting. So that's a great question. Um, another question that came through was, um, from an educator who said a lot of my children have little or no language and how should their artwork be discussed with them and I actually saw lots of great responses coming through from other educators so thank you so much it's really nice to see everyone collaborating already and and supporting each other and what you do in your different services um, so I guess my simple answer to that is even if your children aren't yet verbal, maybe it's related to their age, um, you can still always talk to them about what they're doing. So you can be the storyteller um, and scaffold their language. So talking to them, introducing different artistic vocabulary, and the more you talk them through it, if they're nonverbal, um, the more you're exposing them to that language. So, um, but there were some really other great uh, feedback tips for that question. So thanks everybody. Uh, another good question that came through is, how can I involve a 15 month old in visual art? He is mouthing everything. Um, so as a toddler mother, I'm quite familiar with what you're talking about here. I guess it's really, you know, there's an element of supervision that's required with younger children. But I understand, you know, when you're looking after multiple children, that can become quite challenging. There are some lots of non-toxic materials available these days. But also something that's quite new is materials, art materials that are made um, of completely natural ingredients. So for example, I bought my toddler recently some beeswax candles um, and they smelt quite sweet. So there was that sensory experience as well, um, but they, they're completely natural. So I could just let him go with it. And another thing I purchased for him was some finger paints that were made from vegetable dyes. So again, there was nothing in there that wasn't completely natural. So if he felt the need to have a taste um, or, you know, rub it all over his face, I knew that it was going to be fine to do so. Um, but if you are using materials that you can't be that lenient with, I guess, yeah, really supervising and trying to um, scaffold their learning. So making sure that they're using those materials appropriately. So you could even demonstrate what you um, want them to do with that material beforehand, which is a good idea with the younger children. Um, okay, so I'll just see if there were any others. <clears throat> I think that's, oh, there was one more. Um, and I think the um, this might have come through before the interview because I think she spoke about this um, a bit, but obviously if there's, where's a good place to begin if I want to get more arty as an educator um, and I don't have a big budget. So I really believe, um, I've been an educator for a long time and I really believe that artistic um, creativity doesn't need a big budget. 
Um, I really like um, her comments on investing in um, slightly higher quality materials, definitely, because they do last longer and they do provide a nicer experience for the child. Sometimes we think, oh, the children are so young, um, they won't notice if they're, you know, really cheap texts or pencils or whatever it is. But actually children at a young age, um, you know, if something's not working well or if it's not doing the job that it needs to do, you know, if the texts are running out really quickly or if the pencils aren't smooth and it's hard to colour, it's not fostering that love of art. So I do believe that you need to invest in um, materials that work well. But also if you are limited in your budget, there is so much around us in our environment, in our local community that we can use. Um, so, for example, you could hire some books from the library um, about artists and use the imagery in those for inspiration about how to, um, about, you know, what different children can paint or create. Um, the library's got wonderful resources or simply looking in your garden, you know, picking some flowers in your garden or collecting leaves some natural materials. If you're going out into the broader community, if you've got a local um, garden or, you know, you've got people in the street with a beautiful garden, you could take some photos of flowers for the children to paint. Um, the recycling bin, as she said, you know, on Play School, you always have a bucket of things that uh, can be reused for different ways and children are so creative and inventive. You give them a bucket of um, clean recycled materials and it just provides endless opportunities. So I think you can really definitely work around around budget. Okay, well, thank you so much everyone for those questions. They're fantastic questions. Uh, that actually brings us to the end of tonight's session. Um, remember that we will also be sending you further readings and these have been handpicked for you so they're full of really useful information for you to enjoy um, and you will get those in your email. You can also participate in the closed Facebook group that I mentioned before. If you haven't already joined, you can open up Facebook and uh, type in PD in your pocket and you should be able to find that. Um, so thank you so much, everyone, for taking the time this evening to join us. I hope you've enjoyed tonight's session and we really look forward to seeing you at the next one. Thanks, everybody. Good night.